Our next speaker is Craig Tomler. Craig is an online veteran and government 2.0 advocate with 20 years experience in the digital sector, including five years in the Commonwealth Public Service leading online initiatives. He now consults independently to senior executives seeking to build mature and sustainable digital infrastructure, developing digital strategy and supporting crowdsourcing and social media initiatives. Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just, um, I guess, you know, picking up on the trove theme that seems to be going through this morning, um, I just note that I haven't looked up my family. I don't know what they've done in the past. But Trove has been, through Pandora, archiving uh, my blog on e-government over the last nine years. Um, so it's sort of on the permanent record, and that's always been a source of sort of honour and uh, for me personally as a citizen to actually uh, be deemed worthy of inclusion in that sort of archive. Um, and my hope with Trove is it's something that will continue centuries into the future. So just as we can now go up to Parliament House and have a look at the Magna Carta, um, one of the, or the best preserved copy in the world, we'll be able to do the same thing in 900 years with Trove to actually look at what... Uh, people were thinking and saying a thousand years ago uh, in the Australia of the past, whatever it looks like in the future. Um, I, gu I guess it's, it's been a great wide-ranging conversation this morning and there are a few bits and pieces I want to pick up on before I really got into the, the guts of what I wanted to talk about. Um, firstly, um, the conversation about citizenship and digital citizenship I think is a very powerful one and I think it's one we haven't had enough of in Australia. Um, there's countries like Estonia now that have established a, a thing called digital residency where anybody in the world can apply to be a digital resident of Estonia. Uh, it doesn't let you vote, but it does give you certain rights in terms of operating a business and, uh, and actually visiting the country. And it's sort of a precursor of a notion to say, why does citizenship have to be tied to a geographical space or location? You know, isn't citizenship about common values, shared beliefs, and something more important about respecting one another and one's community? And I guess with, with digital citizenship, again, it's exactly the same, in my view, as standard citizenship, as speakers this morning have also contended. And a lot of it is around that respect for oneself and others. Um, and I actually was uh, looking this up just the other day. If you go back to uh, Athenians, uh, Athens' as democracy back in the ancient world, uh, they actually uh, they had a concept for idiot and a concept for citizen, citizen, and they were actually opposed. So an idiot was basically a, a layman who was uh, basically uh, more interested in their own personal affairs and affairs of the, of the, the community and of the state. Uh, they were basically, it was a natural state of ignorance into which everyone was born, whereas citizenship involved education and training. You basically had to be trained to be a citizen. Of course, in ancient Athens, being born into it was important, and of course it was only for males who were, who were free citizens who owned property, but if you go beyond those narrow constraints, they recognised that citizenship was something that had to be taught to people. It wasn't something that people would naturally understand how to actually be a citizen. And I think what we don't do enough of in Australia and in many countries around the world is actually teach people what it is to be a citizen and what it is to actually contribute to the public dialogue, to the community, more so than just looking after one's own personal interests. So idiots were very much seen as having bad judgement in public and political affairs. And I think there's been enough of that around that we can say that, you know, in Australia, not everybody could be considered a citizen under Athenian terms. But I, I guess what I really wanted to focus on today was talking about the importance of data and where libraries fit into that mix. Something we've seen over the last eight or nine years is the growth of open data. The concept that particularly governments, but also in some respects commercial entities, not-for-profits and other groups, are releasing data out into the community for basically for reuse in any way uh, that the community sees fit. Um, in Australia now, both the federal government and the majority of state and territory governments have open data portals and they're releasing thousands of data sets, some of which is useful, some of which hasn't proved particularly useful to this stage. Um, and, but imagine as this goes on, 
what's it like actually living in a, in a naked world, a world where all your data is out there? Now, a standard tactic they often teach speakers is to imagine the audience naked, and I'm not doing that right now, but if you can imagine instead a world where all your data was actually out there, whether it be personal, whether it be political, whether it be public information, whether it be corporate, how would that change the way society would actually function? Now, that's not really likely to be the destination with open data in this country. Um, there are many things that we, we rightly put caveats around for national security reasons, for personal privacy and for other uh, criteria similar to those. But there is a great deal more data going out there. And the first thing is, is quite confronting for people is it does actually hold certain people to more accountability. We've seen things uh, over in Canada, for example, there was a lot of data released about the not-for-profit sector, and, that, and some people analysed it and came up with the realisation that the top uh, 10 or so charities in Canada were actually private organisations that were just using them as tax shelters. And that prompted an enormous amount of uh, activity in the Canadian government, legal change, and they pulled in about an extra billion and a half per year in taxes out of that. Um, fortunately, we release a lot of that data here already, and that's not the case in Australia, but that sort of impact on society, whether it be through that sort of uh, tax-style impact, whether it's in terms of being able to assess whether programs are actually working or not, regardless of what a politician tells us, or the media tells us for that matter, uh, and the ability for individuals to actually look at and scrutinise those things is of enormous importance in an in a empowered democracy where everybody is an educated citizen. Now, of course, we're moving towards there in a little bit of a haphazard fa uh, fashion at the moment. We're having lots of problems with, with data around privacy and security. Um, in, in fact, in the US, they're talking today about how if you actually make a death threat to Donald Trump or another presidential candidate on Twitter, you get paid a visit by the Secret Service, normally within about 24 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and that's simply because, as uh, Again, Alastair was saying this morning, no one's actually, no one's uh, is actually being private online. They can find out who you are if they really need to, and that sort of death threat is obviously a case where the police and the, and the secret society, uh, secret service takes it very, very importantly. But we also live in a world where people's data is being released quite regularly by corporations, by governments, um, by other organisations, by accident. A lot of the time it's even by organisations that don't have a presence in the jurisdiction in which the data becomes available. Um, you know, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Google, all of those large com companies have at different times had large data breaches that released millions of people's data online. Uh, and in this country we don't even have a formal process to require that companies actually tell people when their data becomes public. It's left up to individuals to find out, sometimes through identity theft or other mechanisms, or if the media actually finds out about it through some sort of investigation. So we only find out after the fact. And what that does is it creates an atmosphere of where we lose trust in what's going on around data. Can we trust giving our data to anyone out there? Can we actually then rely on them to keep it secure and safe? What does that mean for when government needs information from people? What does it mean when we're having a transaction with government where you don't trust the person on the other side of the counter, or the screen for that matter? It's not good for our society and it's not good for democracy. Now, some of the actions to take it obviously have to happen here in Canberra at a federal level through laws and other me mechanisms. But there are also a lot of measures that individuals can take to protect themselves. Some of those are, are covered through offices like the eSafety. Uh, Office of eSafety does some of that work with a certain group of people. But there are a lot of people out there who are missed in the gap. Um, we're not dealing with uh, a lot of these issues that adults are facing. And it doesn't matter, even if you're in one of those low-income uh, households and you don't have personally an internet connection in your home, your data is still stored with organisations who might leak it online. What protections do you have? How do you actually guarantee your own safety and security in those sort of cases? 
So in a lot of these, this is where I come back to libraries and their role in the community. Historically, libraries have been a place of basically preserving data for public consumption. So we call that data books, and we call that consumption borrowing and reading. But the fact is that libraries have a central role in the data life of our society. They are the biggest collectors of data in a, in a formal, systemised way through programs like Trove and other mechanisms. And they also have the largest network of points where they can actually share that data with the public, with the community through many different uh, uh, avenues. Now, of course, traditionally it's been books, then it moved on to videos, then on to computers and CDs and those sort of devices. But the fact is, at the end of the day, the role of the library is still the same, to actually collect, preserve and ensure that that data is accessible to the public and can be reused in a knowledgeable and informed way. And that's where I think that libraries have a key role into the future. It isn't necessarily about large buildings full of books. Uh, it isn't necessarily about what you actually hold within your own archives. It's actually about the skills of librarianship. The ability to actually curate knowledge and to then be able to work with people in the community to help them actually understand that knowledge and actually use it in meaningful ways. And this is one of the biggest challenges in the whole open data movement at the moment. There's lots of data being released out there. Great, it's public. People can go on to data.gov.au or one of the state sites and actually get one of those data sets. But what do you do with the data set? Unless you're in a group of people who are experienced computer programmers or you're a data scientist or someone with a particular affinity to dealing with numbers, that open data is largely useless to the majority of the population in a direct way. You can't be a good citizen, an educated, effective citizen who can contribute meaningfully to the public debate if you can't understand the, the reasons on which decisions are made or the data that either supports that decision or shows that the decision was not the right one. All you can do is basically go and vote for someone who says you can trust me. And when trust is a scarce commodity, then that is a, a very difficult place to put citizens in. So this is where libraries, again, are critical in this entire process. Aside from that role in terms of curating the knowledge and being able to allow people to access it, there's a major role in actually helping people interpret what that data actually means. Whether it's actually finding a book on a particular topic which helps them deal with a, some sort of issue in their personal life, or whether it's actually understanding where to find and how to interpret the data on a decision that affects their life, there is a key role for librarians now and into the future, whether or not we have edifices called libraries, because they are gradually moving online. Eventually, the entire world will be a library, where all that data is stored, it's at everyone's fingertips. But unless if we have librarians there who can help people to understand and interpret that knowledge, then that knowledge, again, it is lost, it is not preserved, it is worthless to society. So if you link librarianship to citizenship and to the decisions that are made in our public lives and in our personal lives and the criticality of having access to the data that makes the difference in the decisions that we take, librarians play a critical role and will continue to do so into the future. And I think that is what librarians really need to be thinking about now and into the next decade. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Craig. I'd also argue that uh, there is a role for journalists now and in the future too to be, um, <laughs> to be able to understand data and uh, understand statistics, under understand data, um, to be able to inform the public about what is really going on. Uh, 